Okay, we'll make a start, get underway. Um, this morning's a little bit different, in that it's a little bit more interactive. I've got questions for you to answer, um, but we've still got to finish at 9.40, so we'll see how we go. But it doesn't matter if we don't get through it, because we'll just carry on next week. So let's just start with a word of prayer, right? Father, we just thank you that we can gather and just come to study your word, Lord, and talk about the whole idea of being compelled uh, to share your gospel, an amazing hope that we have that we can share with other people. I just ask, Lord, that you will encourage us as we look at different ways of evangelism. And today, Lord, as we just go through today's uh, section, just ask, Lord, that we will be open to what you have to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're on page seven in the book, and it's called Witnessing for Christ. I just wanted to start off with this. It is the Holy Spirit, not we, who converts an individual. We, the privileged ambassadors of Jesus Christ, can communicate a verbal message. We can demonstrate through our personality and life what the grace of Jesus Christ can accomplish. But let us never naively think that we have converted a soul and brought him to Jesus Christ. No one calls Jesus Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we, we have no power in saving people. And it's very important that we recognize that that. Our role isn't to save the person. Our role is to share the gospel to a person so they may be saved and that the Holy Spirit can start working in them. You cannot cause someone to be a Christian. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. And you'll notice that all the cults around the world, we looked a little bit at this last week, are very strong in their sharing. They're very strong in their witnessing. They're very, they go out, they do visitation. They're, they're very strong. And I'm, we may not like their methods. We may not like what they have to say. But you've got to give it to them. They're very strong in their uh, sharing of their faith. Of course, what compels them is the idea that uh, you've got... Oh, that's right, I've got to stand still. <laughs> got to remember that. Uh, what compels them is the idea that if they do good, they'll get to heaven. That's what compels them. That's not what compels us. What compels us is the message of love. You know, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Iglesia de Cristo, which is a Filipino cult group, they go on, they're out every day witnessing and telling people about their hopeless message. <coughs> While as Christians, we've got the hope, yet we're satisfied and don't tell anyone about it. You know, there's just that little difference there. But the Holy Spirit is the one that converts people and changes their hearts. But the privilege of sharing this message has been given to us. We are, uh, have been given the ministry of reconciliation. That's what 2 Corinthians 5 tells us. We've been given the ministry of reconciliation. And just consider this. I'm not going to limit God. But think about it like this. Without us sharing the message of Christ to people around us, are we limiting the work of the Holy Spirit in that person's life? Okay. The Holy Spirit takes the word. We've been studying Romans 10 in uh, our men's group on a Thursday morning about going out and being sent out and sharing the message. And the Holy Spirit takes that message and converts that person into a soul. But, hey, let's not limit God. God can use any method he wants to bring people to Christ. <clears throat> let's look at what the word of God says. So, the challenge. Oops, it's moved up again. Okay. So we're going to Romans chapter 10, verses 4 to 17. And can someone read those verses for me? And we've got some questions I want us to answer there. Romans 10, 4 to 17. Anyway. It's in your notes. So I think I put it in your notes. No, I might not at this time. Christ is the end of the law. So that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Moses describes us describes in this way the righteousness that is by law. The man who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into death? Sorry, into the deep. That is to bring Christ up from the deep. But who but what does it say? The word is near. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. That if we confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God 
guides you from the dead. You will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all the rich, richly blessed and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on one day, sorry, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Is it? Yes, but. But, <laughs> not, not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For, Israel, for, for Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. Okay. So I've got a few questions here I want us to just look at. And it's it's not because I don't think you don't know the gospel. But I think often as we as we grow in our Christian faith, we add to the gospel, not intentionally, but we, we forget the gospel message. And <laughs> as we look at this, I just want us to remind ourselves uh, of these. So the first question is, what did Jesus Christ do by dying on the cross? From those verses. Verse 4. So we will, we will be made righteous. Okay, so he was the end of the law so that on the life of man. Okay, he ended the law by dying on the cross so that we were not burdened down. Remember, in the Old Testament, it was all sacrifices and rituals for sin. Sin offerings, they had to choose the best, not the leftovers, they had to choose the best, take it to the temple, went through a process, and then it was offered as a sin offering. What Jesus Christ did is he ended the, the law on the life of man. Okay, He ended the reign of the law, and grace entered in. So this is one of my things that I often hear about Christians. when I, you know, we, we believe that God fulfilled the law, but not on certain things. No, Christ ended the law. He was fulfilled the law. He, every perfect thing was found in Christ. And that's why grace can enter in. So we don't bring back in bits and pieces of the law so that we can say, well, we've still got to do this, still got to do that. The law was ended. For the reign of the law on the life of man ended due to uh, Christ dying. All these sacrifices and rituals were ended because, as Hebrews tells us, Jesus Christ was the perfect sacrifice for sin. There is no more. Yes. Um, well, so does this mean that uh, the law on tithing would disappear? That's a different subject, but I'll say simply yes. Okay. Yep. Uh, the other thing is that uh, the Ten Commandments are actually still a guideline to what God wants and what He doesn't want. They are a guideline, but remember Christ fulfilled those, and we cannot fulfill them. No, no, we, we can't fulfill it, but we, but we still have to live a life that is um, good before God. Yeah, we still yeah. have to do that, but let, let's not... But I'm not going to get into heaven by doing that. No. Yeah. You see, this is what we're looking at the gospel. Christ has done that. Yeah. He fulfilled that law, because we couldn't fulfill that law. And even James tells us, if you're guilty at one point, you're guilty of it all. And there's not one of us here who have not broken the Ten Commandments, if you want to go there. Okay? But he has fulfilled that because he's the perfect sacrifice, so it is by grace. Sure, it's a guideline, but don't confuse it with the gospel. Okay? The gospel says it is by grace you have been saved because Jesus Christ ended the reign of the law. He introduced a new righteousness, as Karen pointed out, that was apart from the law. And this is a problem that happened with with religious organizations. And look, we have to be very careful that we don't keep putting a law. So Hank mentioned the tithing. You know, that, that's an interesting one. We, we believe Christ ended the law, but we like to keep the tithing law. Or we like to keep the Sabbath law. Did he end the law or not? Did Christ end the law? Did he reign? You know, did he, all these things, did he, he, he fulfill them? Yes, because he's the perfect sacrifice. All these laws were given 
So that, and if you'll read it in Romans 3.20, all these laws are given for one reason, that man will know what sin is. Okay? That's what Romans 3.20 tells us. The law was given so that man would know what sin is. So he's, he's introduced us to righteousness, and that's why the Israelites couldn't accept it. For suddenly their religious rights and organizations and all that couldn't accept grace. And that is one of the struggles that many people struggle with. There is nothing I need to do. I don't have to pay for this grace of salvation. So we've got to remember the gospel is a gospel of grace that God has done. Can I just uh, make a quick comment there? Um, the greatest law is was in the Old Testament that you should love God um, with your heart, soul, and mind, and your, and your, and your neighbor like yourself. Jesus actually repeated that law. So that law is still going. Uh, don't confuse the law with the gospel, Ken. Yes, that is true, and we can't fulfill it. No, That's why we have Jesus Christ. But Jesus still says, this is still the greatest law uh, to the Pharisees, so it means it is still the greatest law. Um, we still have to live, not to get our salvation free, uh, but it is something that we have to do because we live in Christ uh, and that is the law that we have to, we have to love God we have to love God, that's all that matters that's why we love the Lord Jesus, isn't it? isn't Jesus God? yeah, but yeah okay. so, so what you're talking about is Christian living I'm talking about the gospel mm. okay. I do not love God uh, like, like you follow the Lord's way mm. in the gospel, the gospel is to turn to the Lord Jesus, and we'll look at that in a few minutes. Okay. okay? What does righteousness by faith say in Romans 10, 5 to 8? What does it say? The word is near you. Right? Yep. The word is near you. The word is now um, easily accessible. That is Jesus Christ. There's no need to go to the temple to fulfill the, the, the uh, laws or the word. Because the word has been brought to close to us by the death of Jesus on the cross. Okay? We often miss the concept of the word being near us. Christ is near us all the time. I have this habit of walking away, don't I? <laughs> no, they don't want me to. <laughs> the word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. And that comes from Deuteronomy 30. You no longer have to go and search for it because it's right there. We are privileged in this country. We have, I mean, who here has uh, what, at least one translation of the Bible in their house? Who here has at least five? Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we get so, so <coughs> stocked up on the work on Bibles in our, in our house, don't we? Whereas a lot of people only have a page or, or a half a Bible or, or the New Testament. We have, it's so accessible. But let us remember, the word here is Jesus Christ. Okay, no, let us not forget that. It's just that often we refuse to look and be, uh, and avoid it, so it doesn't convict us. Okay, the word of God. And one of my things in, in evangelism is always use scripture. Now, you don't have to pull out your Bible and say, uh, the Bible says this. But you should have it in your mind so that you can easily bring, call it, and, and more powerful. Remember Paul said, he did, I did not come to you with convincing words and arguments, but I came to you with the word of God. Okay, And that's what's important in, in witnessing, is using scripture. Now you may not have the whole verse, but you may remember, oh, the Bible said this somewhere. And you don't go off and say, the Bible says, no, this, that's saying you're a biblical scholar. So you'll get some really tough questions here. But just say, oh, I remember reading this, it says this. And if they ask, then you've got a way into the conversation about sharing the gospel of Christ. I use that technique a lot when I'm sharing with people. I will, we'll be talking about a problem, we'll be talking about a struggle, and I'll say something like, well, I've read this, don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, in prayer and, and, and uh, thanksgiving, Give your request and oh, oh where did you read that? Oh, I have this book. And we pull out the Bible. 
You're using techniques, just using bits of scripture uh, to, in your daily life helps. It's there, it's right there. And we can use it. Okay? Let's go to this one. I've got a bit behind. How are we saved? Romans 10, 9 to 13. And this is important because I think we put in a lot of extras. Okay? What does Paul say here about being saved? <coughs> Verse 9. You confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Okay, let's just stop there. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. We have reduce the gospel to Jesus Christ just being a saviour. Okay? Paul says, and you'll notice this as you read the word of God, there's about 653 references when Paul writes about Jesus being Lord. There's about 24 about him being saviour. Now, why is that important? Well, I want to take you back to the culture of that time. In that culture, Caesar was the only Lord. If you did not bow down to Caesar, you were either fed to the lions, nailed to the cross, or beheaded. So when Paul said, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, what he was saying is, you Lord are my master and I will not bow down to Caesar. Now today's attitude towards Jesus is, Lord, it's easy to say that, isn't it? Not if you're in a Muslim country. Okay? And, and the whole concept of this confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord is saying, you alone are my master Lord, and I surrender to you. And that is the gospel, surrendering to Christ, giving him authority over our lives. Now we've, we've reduced it, and I'm not saying Jesus is not Savior, don't get me wrong. Okay? But someone might go, oh Jesus is no longer the Savior. No, he is the Savior. And there's mention that he's redeemed us, which is Saviour. But the point of conversion is really Jesus Christ is Lord. Confessing with your mouth. And that is the gospel. Then he says this. Believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. Why do you think that's important? Why do you think that, that truth there is important in the gospel? Well, it does that. Um, if Jesus wasn't raised, we would, uh, we would not be raised. And we'll, there will not be an eternity for us. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> Saying that is that we believe in God, believe that there's a resurrection, believing that Corinthians 15 is, or, is true. Believing in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead it involves a whole lot of stuff about God. The power, the sovereignty. And again, it is saying that I believe in Christ, and I, I give, him, give him all my life, or everything in my life. One of the struggles I have, and I'll be open with you about this, one of the struggles I have with conversions today is there's no transformation. Okay, why is that? Because we're not truly saved. True, because we've reduced it to just a saviour. When... God, it's like when you start a new job, isn't it? You go to a new job, you get a boss, you do what they want you to do. If you don't, you're, you're out of a job. Now that's a bad illustration when you're trying to come to the Lord, but it just gives you the idea. You're saying, He is everything, and I give everything to Him. And what does He like? He doesn't like sin in our lives. So there's that whole transformation idea about Jesus being Lord, about believing in that God has raised us from the dead. What about verse... 11. Anyone? Anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Okay, trust in Jesus Christ. And I like the verse there that anyone who trusts in him will not be put to shame. Because I think it gives a little bit more intent to what it means to trust Jesus. Okay, if you read the verses in, in uh, Matthew and when he talks about, if you uh, stand, uh, proclaim me in front of man, I will proclaim you in front of the Father. When you're saying trust in Jesus, you're prepared to stand up for him. 
And that's part of the gospel. I'm putting my trust in Christ. I'm putting my trust in you alone, Lord. And I'll stand for you. I love what Paul said, and I, I, I go, I, I think I'll bring this up later, but I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it's the power of God unto salvation. I trust in Jesus alone. And then this one. We'll keep moving. Yeah, we'll keep moving. Call on the Lord Jesus. Verse, verse 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In fact, if you have a Bible, I'd encourage you to underline that verse and highlight it. Now, remembering what Lord means, everyone who calls on the Lord, what happens? Will be saved. So he's given us this thing. We, we confess that Jesus is Lord, make him Lord, make him surrender to him, believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, that saying he's sovereign, he's all powerful, that we have a hope, trust in Jesus Christ, saying I will follow you in everything, Call on the Lord Jesus. Make him your Lord and you will be saved. And that is what uh, we see here in Romans 10. So if we go through all this, and this is what I really, I'll just go through it because it's similar. What is the result of these four actions? You will be saved. You are saved. You'll never be put to shame. You're richly blessed. You will be saved. Over and over again, I don't know why we miss this in Romans. Over and over again, he says, if you do these four actions, all result in this. You will be saved. You are saved. You will be put to shame. You are blessed. You will be saved. Within the space of five verses, Paul repeats the assurance that you will be saved. This is to show us that if we have followed what the Lord has asked us, then there is no doubt about your salvation. Okay? There is no doubt about your salvation. So the question remains then is, is Jesus Lord of my life? Now, I've had many discussions around this, uh, and one of our discussions was, when I'm calling him Saviour, I mean Lord as well. Yeah, that might be true. But generally, but the, the error of that person was when you talked about Saviour, it was Lord. In our era, era, era today, you talk about Saviour, you're not talking about a Lord. And we often use the, the illustration of the you know, drowning and you go out to life, the Saviour comes and gets you. That's a good illustration. But it, re, it removes one thing, the importance of Christ being Lord. And that's why I say often our gospel presentation has suffered because we've reduced Jesus to just a saviour. Now, I'll be challenged on that quite a bit, and I don't mind that, but just recently I've been studying the whole area of Lord and discovered that Paul, whenever he talked about salvation, he always used Lord. I started writing down the verses, it got too many, because there are over 650 verses there about where he used Lord as saviour, but it is really important to Paul and Jesus even, he talked about it, that Jesus is Lord of our lives for salvation. Um, how would you describe the difference between Lord and King? Lord and King, similar. Uh, king is more about the reign uh, overall, but I'd say they're similar. Lord is my King, but I think in our era, King has lost its meaning, possibly because of what's happened with the royalty in England. So you've got, you've got to keep in mind the word Lord doesn't lose its power if we really understand what the Lord is. Okay, It will never lose its powers. He is our King, and I don't dispute that. But whenever it talked about salvation, it used it as uh, uh, Paul used it, and Jesus used it as Lord. Okay? Now, uh, explain to me what is Lord. How do you see what what is he, what does this entail, the word Lord entail? Okay, the word Lord, if you, if you really want to look at Lord, yeah. you've got to go back to the culture of the time when Jesus was speaking. Yes. Now, in the culture of, of Jesus' time, when, when there was a Lord, you bowed down to him, you gave everything to him, 
you followed him, you, you, if you disobeyed him, you were, you know, you, you could have been killed because everything, you surrendered everything to the Lord. Caesar was Lord. He could say, I want 70% of your money as tax and you have to do it. Okay? He could say, I want 90% of your money as tax. And we know that often happened in those periods where the people was, were basically just serfs and they, they struggled to live. You see a good example of that is uh, Nebuchadnezzar. You know, um, take everything away, but I still want them to make the same amount of bricks. You know, he has the right to say whatever he wants to your life. That's what law is. And that's the concept of law. And he has, or, or another word we could use, I think it still loses its meaning, but the other concept is master. You know, you go back into that slave period, the master had the right to do whatever he liked to his slaves. How much, how much we disagree with that, that's what it was like within, in that culture, and that's who our Lord is. We get on to the sequence of the journey of faith. Okay? So the preacher is sent. Or, and we talked about this last week about preaching. It's not getting up the front and telling people that uh, it's about just sharing with one another. But we are sent. And we looked at that last year, last week. We are all sent. Christ has asked us. In fact, I want to share this with you. This is a I went to a church down south once uh, when I was home from New Zealand, uh, Philippines, and I preached on the Great Commission, go and, and make disciples. And that verse, I mean, you could preach for a couple of hours, but I did it in 30 minutes because, you know, New Zealand is only like 30 minutes at the most. But I preached on that, and afterwards, a young guy came up to me, a university student came up to me, and, and uh, he didn't come up and say, I'd like to talk to you, or can I ask you a question? He said, Came up and he says, What right do you have us have to tell us to go and make disciples? It sort of blew me away. I think <laughs> the Bible that wasn't for us, that was for the disciples, that was not for us. And he walked off. But that command is for all of us. Okay, Paul repeats it in different words in Romans 10. We are all sent to share the gospel, and it's not about being an evangelist. You know, I've heard people say, you've got to be an evangelist to share the gospel. No, you don't. To me, an evangelist is someone who trains others who, who share the gospel. Even that, yeah, like I say, it is. You know, but we are all sent to share the gospel. Ross will have different people he can share to to me. Karen will have different people that she'll be able to share to the, from me. We have all got contacts. We've all got people that we know that we can talk to. But we're all sin. Once we're sin, the people here. And that's a real difficult one, isn't it? Because you think people are listening to you. Yeah, the verse, uh, um, I believe, <coughs> in Isaiah, um, the word of God will not go out in vain, will not return in vain. I totally believe that. But I also totally believe that often we speak the word of God in vain. Okay, we haven't <coughs> said it so that people can understand it. And this may be using Christian language, it may be going over the top a little bit, preaching at them. So they haven't even heard the word of God. So it's not that it's gone come back in vain, it's gone out in vain. And that's why when, when, we're, when we're sharing the gospel, use the conversational type tone. You're not the preacher when you're talking, when you're sitting down with people. You're looking for ways to work, journey with them. You know, the most effective, you know, and Robert and I have talked about this, Robert and I meet very regularly, this whole style of lifestyle evangelism. I used to be a preacher on the streets. Okay, I was with OAC, we'd go to the garden place, we'd be doing drawings and preaching on the streets. And this whole style <coughs> of lifestyle evangelism came in, and, and we really struggled with it. But as I've looked at New Zealand, when we call lifestyle evangelism, my view of lifestyle evangelism and, and the view of lifestyle evangelism in the past is quite different. Lifestyle evangelism in the past was, I don't have to say anything, I'll just live it. No. You have to speak your, the gospel. People have to hear it. So I live the gospel 
but also I share the gospel. You know, I have an example of, of a lady who I know very close to me who loved how good Christians were and Jehovah's Witnesses were and how Mormons were. She loved them. But no one shared with her the gospel. She couldn't tell the difference. What's different was there between Christians and Mormons and Jehovah's. They all lived a good life. There needs to be that speaking and, and sharing of our gospel that we have, of the hope we have. People hear. Then people believe in what they hear. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. And it may not be today. It may not be tomorrow. It might be five years down the track. It took me three years before I believed and what, what they were telling me. For some people it takes years on end of just people talking about the gospel. But never, and we talk about this, never, you know, never say this person has no hope. We talked about that as a principle last week. Everybody has hope while they're alive. Now they will re they can reject that, but if you're sharing the gospel one day they'll come to you and say, what was that you were telling me about such and such? And you're available. Or somewhere down the track, someone else will be able to share with them. Because it's not a like a competition. It's not how many people you've won to the Lord, or how many people you've won to the Lord, or how many people Hank's won to the Lord. It's not a competition. It's about going out and sharing the gospel so people have the opportunity to believe. And if I meet people in heaven who, were, who were, came to the Christian, not because of the day I shared with them, I will still be happy because they're going to eternal life, not to eternal damnation. Okay? When they believe, the people call on the one they believe. What did Romans say? Call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. So, summary. Faith comes from hearing the message. <coughs> And the message is heard through the word of Christ. Two basic principles in evangelism. Faith comes from hearing. The message is heard through the word of Christ. Each one of us are agents for Jesus. And wherever we are. You may be working with business people. You may be working with homeless people. It doesn't matter. One of the beautiful things I've seen working in the Philippines is you've got the low, people in the, in the lowest, worst situation coming to Christ, and you've got people who are wealthy coming to Christ. And seeing them come to the, to the fellowship together, worshipping the Lord together, not because of who, they are, of, of who they are, but because of what Jesus has done, is an amazing thing to see. And it doesn't matter. Everyone has the, has the opportunity to hear about Christ if the Christians will speak. We have an amazing hope. Do you agree? Yeah. We have the the truth. Do you agree? Yeah. And we've been. What's happened is we've, we've been eaten away by so-called Christian preachers. There's a preacher who says that Jesus is not the way. He's the way for him, but not for other people. Preacher in America. He says that Jesus is not the truth. He's the truth for him, but he might not be the truth for other people says, you know, he's the life for him and his church, but he's not for Muhammad, uh, Christ, uh, Islam or for Judaism. They have their own way. And he's recognized as a Christian preacher. I think he's a preacher of the devil. Because Jesus is the way. The only way. The only truth and the only life. And that's the message uh, we have. And this message is heard. It's dependent on our witnessing for the Lord. How will they hear if we don't speak up? And I'm not saying, again, I want to reiterate this. I am not saying preach at them as from the front of the church like preaching. Remember we discussed last week about preaching. It's about sitting down beside someone and talking and sharing the gospel. Sharing opportunities. Sharing things that come to mind. Taking that opportunity, taking that time. You know, how, maybe like this. How do you think people respond today if you sat down beside and said, you're going to hell? Now, it's true. Well, they laugh at you because they say, I don't believe in hell. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But it's a truth, isn't it? Mm -hmm. 
but it doesn't, it's not effective. <laughs> so as a Christian, we're looking, how can I be effective for God in sharing the message of Jesus Christ? So you've got to get that person to admit that sin is sin. Okay? You've got to get to that point where they can say, you know, uh, man, this is bad, and there should be punishment for that. And that's the role of, I believe, as a witness, is we're bringing them to that point. But also, we've got to bring them to the point of hope. You know, it's very hard leaving someone in, in a place where they think they're going to hell, and you haven't offered them hope. But it, it may take ages to do that. And yeah. my, my point is, journey with people. Now, there will be an opportunity sometimes where you have three minutes, I mean, going to a house and knocked on the door and the lady says, oh, I've been waiting for you to come and tell me about Jesus. She became a Christian within five minutes. Mm. Blew us away because that's not a common thing these days. But there are people like that around and we need to be open to that. I'm just wondering whether to go on. We... No, we'll, we'll stop there for today. Five minutes of questions before we go to prayer time. Any questions? Yes, uh, just a comment uh, with this COVID. I think it was a really beautiful surprise to um, talk to people about the Lord because uh, the question is your friend died. Where do you think your friend is going? Mm-hmm. Now, in but most cases, well, in all cases, where it, with what I've heard, where it wasn't a uh, Christian, they said, Oh, we hope you'll go to a good place. Mm. That's just a, a kind of a hope that he'll go to a good place. Mm. And they're happy with that. Yeah. And we ask him, man, where were you going? They say, oh, I'll, I'll go to a good place. Mm. There, there's something in us, generally, that desires more than just closing your eyes and, and going back to the road. Yeah. Although the other day I was talking to someone and she just said, well, I'm giving back to the Lord, uh, giving back to the ground by dying and, and going back to us. Mm. But... We offer a hope, and I think it's important that we realise our, our society has, although we, we are not what we'd say Christian anymore, there's still that desire about something better. An example of this is, I, I know a guy who, who asked me to do a funeral, and he said, I don't want anything about God, absolutely nothing. So I arranged the funeral so that wouldn't happen. Blow me now if the guy gets up and says, now we hope that uh, such and such has gone to be with the Almighty and playing. I'm sitting there thinking, you just asked me not to say anything about God. <laughs> but there is that concept. We, we, we want hope, especially for our loved ones. And as a Christian, we have it. We have it to share with people. And uh, it's sad that a lot of people don't hear about the hope as we fail to share the message we have. But again... Uh, we, if you missed last week, look at last week's. We talked about um, being guilty for not, not witnessing. I don't want you to feel that. Witnessing is a joy. Witnessing is people, and seeing people turn to God is a joy. And that's the reason we do it. That, the love for people. You know, Jesus loved us so much that he, sent, that he came and died on the cross. That's what compels us. That's what compels us. Because we love these people. It's not because I'm right. You know, I've seen a lot of conversations where I'm right and they just end up nowhere. Okay, It's because I love this person and I want them to come to know them. That's just my alarm. It means I've got to stop. <laughs> okay, let's uh, just spend a couple of minutes in prayer, say two or three or four in a group, and just pray about our service this morning. Thanks for coming and uh, hopefully we'll see you next week. Hope I'm not too harsh on you. <laughs>